Hello and welcome to the session today. This is uh, Professor Farhad. In today's session, I'm going to be meeting with Andre Polgar. Andre Polgar is the founder of One Minute Economics, which is a, a channel similar to mine, but it deals with economics. I strongly encourage you to go ahead and view it. But the main topic today is his new book, The Age of Anomaly. Andre is the author of this book, and in this session, he's going to tell us a little bit more about his channel. So if you're an econ student, you can check it out. And also, but what the most important thing is, he's going to tell us about his textbook, a little bit about his background. So Andre, with, oh, uh, with no time wasting, please go ahead and get started. Perfect. First of all, thanks a lot for having me on. And uh, some of you might have come across a few of my economics videos over at One Minute Economics. And uh, I've been doing it since 2015, although 2015 has been mostly on and off. So uh, 2016 has been the year where I started genuinely taking this, uh, the channel seriously. It basically just started out as me fooling around and wanting to make an animation, or two, an, an animation or two. And I started with inflation, deflation, supply and demand, just the basics and I said that maybe I'm gonna publish one of these animations let's say once every uh, once every couple of months and I'm gonna see what happened well what happened is that people liked them and they encouraged me to make more and I did and I moved on to stuff like how our banking system works because a lot of people want to know but few understood it properly and I said okay let me try to teach fractional reserve banking and then I said okay let me try to teach people about the infamous derivatives that everyone talks about when referring to the previous financial crisis let me try to explain those and I've managed to uh, I've managed to do that as, as well and basically I realized that I was reasonably good at making complicated stuff easy to understand and yes. not only that on the one hand I have lots of students who get in touch with me and say look I appreciate what you're doing I finally understood things that I thought I was never gonna get so on the one hand there's the academic dimension or if you will the part of my audience that consists of students people who you know have a bachelor's in economics people who have MBAs or, and whatever, but on the other hand, I also have regular people, people who aren't necessarily interested in economics or passionate about economics. And my message to them has always been, look, no matter how hard you try, you cannot escape econo the idea of making economic decisions. And even not by not making an economic decision, you're actually deciding not to do anything. Yes. And there are gonna be consequences. And at the same time, though, I understand that people have lives and families and whatnot, so I tell them, look, you can spend 10 hours binge-watching stuff on Netflix, and that's fine, but give me one minute of your time, and in that minute, I promise I'm going to teach you everything I know, really, about economics. And this is this is my main driving force behind the book I'm releasing this week, yes. uh, which is called The Age of Anomaly. I'm going to show it to you guys. Can you please hold quick. it a little bit? Yes. The Age of Anomaly, yeah. Spotting Financial Crisis and Sea of Uncertainty. Thank you. Yep. It's, it's a huge book. It's a huge book. It's like 400 plus pages. But those of you who have read my first book or those of you who follow me on YouTube are, are going to know that my... I write in a very conversational way, yes. so it's not going to yes, seem indeed. as if there's this arrogant economics professor talking to you from his ivory tower. Instead, you're going to think of me as just having a good friend teach you stuff, a friend who happens to be good at economics and money-related stuff. And I, I agree. I tell people about my book that you know I, I'm not the type of person who panics. I'm not you know your average doom and gloomer who thinks that the world's going to end any minute. No. And that's actually the, my main driving force because I, I assert that when someone like myself becomes genuinely worried, it might be a good idea to at least pay attention to the things I'm saying. And um, through the age of anomaly, I take things in a logical manner and I tell people, look, I'm worried about what's coming. I'm, I expand in the book and we're going to chat about this uh, a little yes. later on about what's coming. And in the end, I have two goals with the Age of Anomaly. One, by guiding you through history, by drawing conclusions, and you know, finding common denominators, I try to help people increase the likelihood that they're gonna spot the next financial crash early on. But two, I also tell them they need to have the humility it takes to understand that even someone like myself, who thinks about these things 24 seven, pretty much, even someone like myself might be taken by surprise by whichever black swan event for example would cause a, yes. a deflationary shock or something like that and therefore my second goal is telling people look 
you might not be able to predict quote unquote anything. So it makes sense to gen to dedicate just as much time and energy toward becoming more financially resilient in general. And these are basically the two things I focus on because make no mistake, uh, we are now having a comfortable conversation. We are living in times of relative prosperity and when for better or worse systems are working. But I am worried about at least one major scenario in which, you know, one major scenario that we can consider generation defining. It's not, okay. it's not, I'm not worried, uh, and I, I actually would like to expand on this. I'm, I'm not worried about, uh, please go ahead. Yes, I could you just, I, I like your dot com comparison in the book, how you, how you go from the dot com to the subprime uh, market crash. Could you walk us through this and tell us how it happens? I read the book, it's interesting, but if you just, in your own words, tell us what happened to interest rate and how the effect of the dot com planted the seeds for the subprime and what do you think is going to happen next? I'm very glad you raised this point because um, actually let us start with the dot com bubble okay. and I can use it to explain to people that I'm not worried about a market crash. Like unlike uh, many of my peers, I actually, I, I'm a pretty hands-on guy. Like I don't just, you know, talk about assets, I trade them as well. So it, I'm not, I even trade, I even occasionally trade cryptocurrencies on leverage. So if there's anyone on this planet who isn't spooked by volatility, okay. it's myself. <laughs> but even someone, you know, for someone like me, this is what I, what I want to stress. I'm not worried about the market crashing. I'm not worried about, you know, a 60% crash or whatever. No, I'm worried about a change of narrative. And let us please indeed take one step back please, and yes. remember the dot com bubble. Yes, please. The market crashed. People were panicking, but the narrative was this. Don't worry, central banks and governments are here to save the day. Yes. And in fact, they have taken decisive action. They have lowered interest rates from 6.5% all the way to 1%, which may not seem like much today, <laughs> but it was a huge deal back then. Yes. And the narrative prevailed ultimately, quote unquote, the day was saved. But this came as a pri at a price because that easy access to cheap money facilitated the inflation of, a, of an even bigger bubble, the, dot com, the, the, the real estate. The point. real estate. And yes. as we all know, in 07 to 08, it collapsed as well. And uh, this time, once again, the narrative was pretty much the same. Yeah, we have a market crash, everyone's panicking, but don't worry, central banks and governments have it all under control, except that the market demanded an even bigger dose of stimulus. Yes. Now, fortunately, from the 1% they were lowered to, rates had gone up in the meantime to 5.25%. So not all the way to 6.5%, but still, something decent you could have worked with. But still, it was not enough to lower them to 1% again they had in the US to be lowered all the way to zero, zero that's right. and in the European Union and Japan, they even went negative. Neg negative but yes. even, that, even that was not enough. Money had to be pumped directly into the system to the tune of 85 billion per month in the US, 40 in mortgage-backed securities and 45 in treasuries. In the European Union, the ECB at the height of its QE pumped uh, even more if, you, if we transform it in dollars. And in the end, just please think about this. In the U.S., from 1913, when your third central bank, the Federal Reserve, appeared, from 1913 up until the Great Recession, so in approximately 100 years, the monetary base had grown to 800 or so, to 850 billion dollars or so. 85 billion multiplied by 12 means that at the height of QE, they have pumped one trillion per year into the system. Yes. So more in one year than had existed from 1913 up until the, the Great Recession in yes. almost 100 years. And this is what people need to understand. Of course, we're the business cycle does not scare me. Of course, we're going to have another recession. Of course, you know, there's going to be another crash. And once again, most likely, the, the same federal, narrative yes. is going to be pushed. Yeah, don't worry. I know you're panicking, but hey, we're the government, we're, we're the central bank. Yes. We have it all under control, except one, not even in the United States, you know, we are now uh, only once has it happened that more time passed between recessions. Yes, and that, and if it's a decade goes now. By without yes. a recession, it, it's going to be a record. So cyclically speaking, if you if you want to phrase it that way, we're kind of due or overdue a recession. 
Yes. And when the problem is that in so many years, interest rates haven't gone up dramatically in the U.S. Let's not even talk about the European Union and Japan where things are even worse. <laughs> so at least when it comes to the Great Recession, interest rates have gone up again to 5.25%. This time, the growth rate, the recovery rate of interest rates has been anemic. It has been ridiculously anemic. Yes. So that's one. Then there's two, of course, much like a drug addict. The, the economy. Then, yes. Yeah, the economy, once it has been hooked on econo economic cocaine, if you want to call it that, once it has been hooked on this, it's going to demand an ever-increasing dose. And of course they're going to give it. They're going to say maybe in the U.S., for example, hey, we're going to lower interest rates to negative 1% and we will pump $3.5 into the system per year this time. If the market says, sure, then we're, we might be good to go for another business cycle. But things are so ridiculous. And this is not a prediction. Like if you're on the 10th story of a building and someone and the guy you're with tells you that he wants to jump, you're going to tell him, don't jump, you're going to die. You're not making a prediction. You're stating That's the obvious. reality, and yes. This, yeah, and, and the same principle is valid in our case. The fact remains that sooner rather than later, the market is going to say no. And this no, not the crisis before it, that no is what bothers me. It, it, that no is what keeps me up at night. Because the no in question basically means that the market will say, we no longer have confidence in the ability of governments and central banks to manage things. And unfortunately, people don't realize just how thin the thread is that holds uh, our otherwise well-functioning systems together, and that thread is mostly confidence. Yes. When that is lost, all bets are off. The banking system... One event could trigger that. Who knows what event? Is it a trade yeah, war? Exactly. Is it Who knows what the event would be? Perhaps. Maybe it's a trade war. Maybe it's a banking crisis over in Italy. Maybe it's something else. One financial just... institution, like just like what happened with the subprime market. Uh, Peribas, just uh, they went down and they brought everybody else with them. Exactly, exactly. And this confidence means that we, most people don't realize that there's no such thing, or at least this is true for the overwhelming majority of banks, there's no such thing as a bank that could withstand it if three out of ten people want their money back. Yes. Because we're on a fractional reserve system. Exactly. The, the same way, the same way the monetary system is confidence back as well. And once that confidence is lost, of course, of course, institutions like the IMF have contingency plans. Like the IMF says, don't worry about it. If people lose confidence in the dollar, in the euro, in the yen, we're just going to have a new reserve currency for the world. It's going to be our SDRs, and we're just going to use that. But it's just, it's so foolish to assume yes. that in a climate where things are serious enough to generate a loss of confidence, on such a large scale, we can predict what's going to happen. Would you say that basically the Federal Reserve, they used all their bullets, they're out of bullets at this point, if something happened? Would, would you characterize it this way? I'm, I'm not sure if they're completely out of bullets, but they're pretty darn close to it, yes. Okay. And That's alarming, that's very alarming, yes. It, 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 it is alarming, certainly alarming enough for me to say, look, I'm going to just put my professional life on hold for a while and be all over YouTube. I'm on your channel. I'm everywhere promoting the book. Also, uh, worth noting, I, I don't particularly care about the money. Like, for example, if people buy this book, if they buy it until uh, if they buy it until Sunday, it's going to cost 99 cents, and <laughs> it's 99 cents for a 400 plus page book. You know? Yes. I'm not exactly going to laugh all the way to the bank after this promotion. Yes. You know? And the same way, I have an email address set up, which is called friends at ageofanomaly.com, where you know maybe people are going to see some people are going to see this video when the price has gone up again. Maybe they live in a country that doesn't do business with Amazon and the places where you know where the, the book is available. So yes. If anyone cannot afford the book, or if anyone is not able to buy it because they live in a country that's not supported by these stores, just shoot me an email and you can put it maybe in the description, Andre at, no, sorry, friends at ageofanomaly.com, yes, and I'll give you a book for free, you know? Like, I'm, I'm genuinely making this my top priority, you know? When you sell, yes, I see when, a lot you know, of like passion, a lot of passion, yes, absolutely. Yeah, like, if someone, even if you cannot afford one dollar or whatever it is, if someone wants to read my book, I promise I'm going to get them the book. And this, this is kind of like the war that those of us like you and I who are in the education space are fighting. It's a war for people's minds. It's a, world, it's a war for people's attention. 
because you know how difficult it is to get someone to pay attention to education related stuff you know if, if we look at the disproportionate media consumption habits of people on Netflix and everywhere and how unwilling they are to, that, to allocate even a small portion of that time to educating themselves, to gaining knowledge, it's not even funny. And a lot of these people, a lot of these people are barely getting by. They're living paycheck to paycheck now when for better or worse, especially in the developed world, countries like the United States, Germany and so on, for better or worse, at least systems are kind of sort of functioning. You know, and let's not even start to think about what would happen if these people, who are barely getting by as it is, have to deal with something similar to what I envision in my yes. book. And, and the stakes are very, very, high. very high. Absolutely, very high in my opinion. Absolutely, absolutely. So at this point, what keeps you up at night the most? Would you say, if you want to characterize it that way, concerns. My main concern is not so much, you know, my main concern has to do with the perspective of the average person, because as I mentioned in my book, throughout history, throughout history, the average person tends to be on the losing end whenever something like this happens, because inevitably, inevitably, when confidence in the system is lost, there will be a huge transfer of wealth. And that's precisely the average person that tends to be on the losing end of this transfer of wealth. And that is what keeps me up at night. Okay. And that is what made me, like, I have, I think I've shot about 100 collaborations in anticipation of this book. I'm going to be all over YouTube. I worked, you know, pretty close to 24-7 to kind of spread the word about my work as much as possible. And maybe I did it for a selfish reason. At the end of the day, I did it because I don't want to feel guilty. I don't. I, I want to say that <laughs> yes, after we, the next we, financial crisis hits, I as educators, sometimes we feel that way. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't want to have you know kind of like this, this feeling of guilt ultimately. Yes, yes. Would you like to add anything? Would you like to share anything with the with my subscribers, with my viewers, with the world? What I want to tell people is this. And it's the only thing I'm asking of them. Like, if if, if you pick up the Age of Anomaly, great. If you subscribe to my YouTube channel, I would be happy to have you on. But even if you don't want to do that, at least don't close this browser window and move on with your life. I consider it a huge, huge win if you guys just take a few minutes to meaningfully think about the things we've discussed. Do your own research, draw your own conclusions, but at least think about these things because there's no escaping them. And when the inevitable occurs, because again, you know, as you've seen, I'm not, actually, I'm not in the business of making predictions. As yes. far as this campaign I'm, I'm on is concerned, as far as me spreading awareness about my work is concerned, I am here to state the obvious, and this, this is what people need to understand. Yes, we are on an unbelievably, unbelievably unsustainable path. Yes. And when it all comes crashing down and again history is our guide yes it's going and you did a good job historically outlining that process you showed again and again at the beginning of the book historically crashes do happen and you had multiple multiple uh uh, facts of, of that exactly and um can i tell you exactly when and how things are going to unfold no i cannot but what i can tell you and this should be i think the conclusion of our show what I can tell you is that I would much rather start preparing a year too early than a week too late. I see. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Andre. From This is Farhad Accounting Lectures. Once again, One Minute Economics. You can check it out as an accounting student. Thank you very much and uh, good luck. Thank you guys for watching us. Take care. Bye-bye.